It's one of the most vibrant places in the world. Definitely the warmest place for music lovers, I would say. There's always music. It's definitely a good gig. Glaswegians are, are really, really up for it. <laughs> but I ain't like a Glasgow audience. If they don't like you, by Christ, they'll let you know in a hurry. London will sell tickets, Manchester, a bit of Birmingham sometimes. Glasgow, Glasgow, you can sell a ticket. I think it is one of the music capitals of the world now. Katie Tunstall, Scottish, Mogwai, Bella Sebastian, Franz Ferdinand, Twin Atlantic, Father Son and Biffy Clyro, do you know what I mean? Massive. I want people across Scotland to be very clear what is now expected of all of us. Effectively, Scotland is now in lockdown. 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 We're all fighting for our jobs. We're having our soul ripped out. Full steam ahead for ages to then just nothing. When we heard of the lockdown happening, this bar stayed open to the, the last night that we were able to. And we, we closed at, I think, 12 o'clock that night. We had a band on and everything. And the place was quite uh, was quite busy. Looking back, I don't know how good an idea that was at the time, but nobody really understood what was happening. They All they were saying was to wash your hands. That was like the advice in March. It seemed like all the venues had been um, just ducked under the water. Because actually, we weren't initially told to close. We were told... People were told not to visit. Nobody really knew what was going to happen, if there was going to be any support. We were unsure what was going to happen with things like furlough. Most people I know didn't even know what that word meant at the time. And I remember telling the staff it'll be a few weeks, probably. Um, we'll all we'll be back to it in a month or so. And then things kind of ticked over. We knew it was going to be difficult, but sometimes life stuff goes. Cool. We were disappointed. We started losing all the events that we had, kind of March, April, May time. There was a lot of, like, frantically people cancelling. Rescheduled probably 180 to 190 shows. 150 gigs. Maybe 140, 150 gigs we've cancelled. Hundreds of shows. 400 gigs or something, 400 gig nights or something like that so far. Our bands, anyway. It's a lot of events. I mean, we have music on in you know, one shape or form, seven nights. Get rescheduling and then rescheduling again. So, you know, things that were happening in March and April got rescheduled September, October. Now they're getting rescheduled to, you know, March, April next year. And then people are now looking at, you know, backup dates towards the end of next year. So we're almost carbon copying what was going to happen this year into next year now. Thousands of pounds worth of refunds. It's, yeah, it's not been good. We were told, you know, try screening the place off and you know, have the stickers on the floor so people know where to queue and there's always, there's a, you know, maybe try only doing table service and things like that. So we just did it all, basically. Did everything that we were told. Pretty much any time legislation has changed, the day it's changed, we've changed with it. Our live stage basically became an extra table, two tables for people to come in and use. Uh, it's just quite depressing to see taking your equipment off the stage and stuff. We took out the sound system to create more room, you know, for distancing because obviously the sound system takes up a bit of space. So the, we maximised the amount of space we could give people. We turned this whole hall and the restaurant and we managed to get socially distanced numbers in there. We've got the two ginormous outside areas in the square to the front and the big patch of grass to the left hand side that we got granted the licences for. So it gave us a full capacity, about 350, 400 bums on seats with one metre distancing when we were allowed to fully open. A lot of bars had maybe like repurposed, whereas we knew it just wasn't feasible to be open, have 12 people in. The music ban was something that I think shocked a lot of people who run music venues or pubs or any part of the hospitality industry. <laughs> um, the music ban is just an absolute farce to be the only country in the world to ban live music. It's just a joke. No music, no background music. It's very difficult when you're on a music pub. I get it. Uh, it was worth trying. Has it worked? I don't know. It was something that I think a lot of people still question and nobody can really work out why Scotland's the only country in the world that banned it. It's how you control the volume in a room is by controlling the volume in the room. 
Um, and to remove that control factor, you just... It, it not only removes the atmosphere, but it removes any direct control you have over volume. The music is cut off. Uh, it's made it difficult to to give people an incentive to come to a bar if they can't listen to tunes. They're not allowed to sing, they're not allowed to speak loudly with one another. That was another thing that just made it impossible for us to reopen my kind of music venue as a bar with absolutely no music. A lot of venues are looking at doing socially distanced type shows. And for those venues who can do it, I think that a lot of people are finding that quite rewarding. Our capacity seated was 350 to 400. And then standing, if for a standing music show, our capacity would have been 600. I think it's 220. And now I think we can operate it with social distancing with all the tables full at like 90, I think it is. That's now cut down to about 100 seated, just over 100. Um, for a standing music show, I, I don't know, potentially 150, maybe 200. Our usual capacity is 200. The capacity, I think, is down in the mid-70s. Capacity's gone from being 300 to 23. Generally, we would need to be at 80% of our normal capacity to break even. That is not a feasible model for running shows. For a venue like this, where we've got 600 capacity and most promoters need to come down and sell that out to bring a big band in, you know, that's not viable with 120 to 150 people that we could fit in here. It is good to do these shows, but I wouldn't like to see that venues like mine, 100 capacity, if we were to open this place up to an audience, we'd be allowed 16 people, including bar staff, security, and performers. That just doesn't work. If I was asked, would you like to open a grassroots music venue under these circumstances, what you're able to offer is people sitting distance from each other, in seats, watching one or two performers on a stage, keeping distant from each other, possibly with a bit of, you know, uh, plastic tape between you and the person next to you, whatever. Probably no, I'd say, no, that sounds like a really bad show. And whether people would really buy into that is the bit that we don't know. Socially distant, the, the thing with gigs is it's about the atmosphere and a socially distanced gig it doesn't work, in my opinion. It's because as great as the band could be, there's, there's still that sort of lacking in energy if you can't all pack together and dance and sing like as a as a big group. It's not the same as a sweaty little box, everyone's got a pint in their hand, the band take to the stage and completely blow your mind. Um, that is an experience that we haven't had for seven, eight months and by the looks of things, isn't gonna come back for at least another possibly seven or eight months, maybe longer, who knows. Since lockdown happened, I think for us, Music Venue Trust was like a massive lifeline. So I'm now the National Coordinator for Music Venue Trust in Scotland. And we work with a network of just over 80 venues. Beverly Whitrick and Mark David set it up together as an idea that venues which were in danger of closing could be brought into community ownership and essentially held in trust. So a bit like a national trust kind of model. Um, but without making that their main project, uh, in the early years, it became clear that the most important thing was just to stop the risk of permanent closure altogether. Anything to help people realize that and shine a light on that um, is fine by me. And so, yeah, the Music Venue Trust gets a big, you know, thumbs up from me completely. I'm glad to be a patron. Maybe some venues locally might know each other, but now the venues in Edinburgh know the venues in Yorkshire or, you know, the London venues now know the venues in Leeds, etc. And it feels like a much closer network that they do. So specifically, the Music Venue Trust runs the Music Venues Alliance. And that's all those venues working together. I think the biggest thing is that you've got other people there that you can call on. It's nice knowing that, you know, you do have contacts with the hundreds of other grassroots venues across the UK. There's a lot of groups that work in music, a lot of, uh, you know, acronyms and uh, people that have inserted themselves into the funding process that aren't always particularly helpful, whereas MVT, I think, have found they've been very helpful. When the huge culture announcement of £1.57 billion pounds was made available for the arts in general. Grassroots music venues were seen right from the start as being part of that. And it was really down to Music Venue Trust putting a huge input into making sure that the general cultural attitude was such that they should be there. It's the first time like a lot of music venues have been maybe taken seriously. There's a real change in attitudes and how venues are treated and the understanding of it. And that's really where Music Venue Trust came in. If it wasn't for Music Venue Trust, we'd probably have closed by now at this point, I think.
There is a real core idea of what a grassroots music venue is, and it is typically the places which are research and development hubs for local talent to go on, develop their careers, and later on springboard into something bigger. But also they tend to be the places where touring acts play. When audio opened, it was primarily putting on bands that might not perform in other venues. It really matters these small rooms are available for people to be niche, to be different, to be something cult something really special that way. Some people think a band just goes in and they play the, the hydro or even maybe the barrelands upwards. Um, they hear them on the radio, they see them on telly, they, 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 they get sucked into their social media and it's just like they're a successful band or a successful music act. Um, I don't think they realize that there's usually uh, a decade, if not more, of really hard work for no thanks and usually no money that goes before any band, any act connects with an audience. Bands need somewhere to start. You can't just start in huge arenas. They're the place where musicians cut their teeth and learn their craft and understand what it is to be an actual functioning, working musician. Playing small venues is a totally singular style of training that you get. You don't just, you know, stand on a stage for the first time and kick out the jams and do it perfectly. You you learn, you make mistakes, you fall off the edge of the stage, you trip up over your cables, you unplug yourself, you say the wrong thing in between songs, you play, you know, your slow song at the beginning and everyone goes to the bar. You do, you make all the mistakes countless times before you, you realize what it is to be a good live act. You can see every single person in the room. You can hear every single person in the room. Um, and you know, you don't, there's no, there's no distractions. There's no back, there's no like fancy backdrop or production or, you know, mad lighting, um, dry ice, <laughs> dry ice in a grassroots event. You should just be someone smoking a fag. It's so exciting when you go to a small venue and you see a band that just blow you away and you're like, these are going to be massive. You've got to be quite vulnerable and, um, it's quite a raw experience and you can fall on your arse quite heavily in front of a small crowd. When that band does get big and you can tell that story of being out of, I saw that band and there was like a hundred other people there. Even artists that are well known that you wouldn't expect to have played in grassroots music venues actually did. Um, where I'm sat right now is where Lewis Capaldi was performing on Friday last week and he chose a venue where he wanted to do a live stream from where he played a number of shows when he was younger. Getting written about by the local newspaper or the list or the skinny or a blogger is important. Getting played on the radio is important. Uh, getting decent streaming numbers on your streaming platform is important. But playing shows in front of your contemporaries, your peers, other musicians, your pals, and building an audience is the most important thing in a young emerging uh, artist's career. It was sort of suggested that live music sector was unviable or unsustainable. Um, it's simply not the case. The UK music industry is one of the biggest in the world. It's worth 5.2 billion in 2019. Live made up a huge proportion of that, and this year was the first year where live was actually worth more than recording industry, which is totally amazing. In fact, the 15-year trend where time on time grassroots music venues more were closing each year than were opening changed in 2019. And in fact, in 2019, for the first year in over 15 years, there was more grassroots music there were more grassroots music venues opened than closed. So there's no question that it's a growth industry. It's seen year on year growth. When we get past this, I think we could see that, you know, uh, what do they call it? A square root shaped recovery, you know, it dips and then it hits right back up. And that's where we'd love to be. They talk about, well, UK is world beating in, I don't know, arms trade or renewable energy or there'll be something. But if there's one thing the UK is actually world beating in, it's music and the arts. That's actually where they're at the pinnacle. And the soft power element is that's so important as well. You know, if Boris thinks we're ever going to get a tourist into the UK ever again, they better have a music industry or else it's not really going to happen. The arts are in, you know, a catastrophic situation right now. But think about the venues, it's the bookers, the promoters. Management positions, there's a 
the engineers, the venue owners, the merch people, the people that work behind the bar, lighting tech, sound tech, event managers, the roadie, DJs that rig the stage, the kitchen team, the bar, restaurant staff, that do the, the door, that take the money at the door, the guy potentially driving the van, the licensing trade, that clean the toilets, you know, you name it. Most less the whole of the hospitality sector because they're all interconnected. This is the thing, I think people that don't work in the industry don't realise how many people it takes to put on a show. All of those people are without work right now. So it is an absolute tragedy for the live music industry, for live music and live musicians. It is awful. This isn't something where I'm money grabbing, where I'm like, you know, let's take a bit out of the healthcare budget, make sure it goes to the arts, etc. It's not really about that. It's about saying that we've got something culturally, which Scotland in particular really knows it wants to keep but it has to put its money where its mouth is because actually to be able to get up to this level again, like Scotland is so famous for its music venues and its music scene, that if you have the permanent closure of a venue, the expense of reopening a venue or opening a new venue on a different site, etc., is so much more expensive than keeping what you already have. So the maintenance of the current cultural infrastructure is really the priority. You need places like that to keep, you know, for your city to, to thrive and the uh for people visiting to have a, have a good time. It drives people to the city, it brings people here. We're known to have like some of the best crowds in the world. We're known to have that absolute atmosphere and that electricity that rocks through the venues when we're going full belt. Like Glasgow would not be the same city without us. Scotland has its own music industry, its own infrastructure. That can be world beating. And so developing that over this time, where we've got a chance to think about it, and then building back better, as everyone always says about everything these days. It's been two decades of chaos that have had a lot of detrimental effects on the health of music. Maybe somehow from this situation there's something that can be pulled out of the fire that's actually quite positive. We need these venues to be able to really like bring the talent through again properly and like springboard it all the way up to the world stage. Music is a is big business. You know, it's not just grassroots getting 50 quid for a support slot kind of stuff. It makes millions for the economy. So the knock-on effect um, for all of the different people who work within the industry I mean, you can't plan for anything. How can you plan for a festival even in 2021 when you don't know what the restrictions will be like at the end of next week? All that we want is some kind of open communication. But it's also important to show us figures, facts, reasons why we need to close our businesses and, I mean, basically <laughs> our livelihoods, you know? One, we're first of life, is we're gonna still keep it super safe and everything's gonna be seated to start with. and. As soon as we can open up more and more, you know, it will be a, a phased thing. It's not just going to be like pile in and let's uh, let's all get COVID together. You know, it's not going to be like that. We only thought this would last a few months, and it's been nearly a year. So I don't know. I'm not really in a position to say what's going to happen. Well, I think Glasgow's music scene will clearly be in a different place in a year's time. The confidence in gig goers is going to take a long time to get them back up to just feeling like coming out, having a beer and watching a gig in a sweaty basement. I hope that when things start to go back to normal, the attitudes start to go back to normal. It's going to take years to recover fully, but you know, I'm hopeful that for us anyway, and, and Glasgow's seen that you know everyone will buy back into it as soon as possible. I mean, I'd like to be going to music shows again in a year's time, fingers crossed. And hopefully all the bands will be super good because they've had so much time to practice. <laughs> There's no excuse anymore. When music venues reopen, get out there, buy tickets, buy a pint, and these venues will survive. But it's all about making sure that you do attend the shows when they're there again. You've got to come and support the scene because if we don't manage to bounce back in a pretty decent way, then they won't probably won't be around for much longer. I think live music will come back as soon as it possibly can. I think the audience is want it, the musicians definitely want it, and the venues most definitely want it. They, they've been shut for months and months and months. And rather than just spending all your, you know, 80 quid going to see some has-been doing a reunion tour at the Hydro, spend eight quid going to see some amazing new artist at any number of small venues or come here, spend nothing, get a couple of pints and maybe see something that changes your life. You know, if grassroots bands don't get the support that they deserve, then you're not going to get any of your bigger bands and you're not going to get as rich a culture from Scotland if we're not allowed to to have all this music. Without those bands, you know, you're just looking at an empty stage. When live performances return, which they will, I'm hoping 
gig goers don't need that much encouragement. I think we're all going to be so hungry for collective experiences. It's not very much to do without um, without uh, music and drinking. <laughs> It feels like we're only doing half a job just now. Let us come back, do some test events. Let us come back and show you what we've got, what we can do, show us how responsible we can be. Let's give some jobs back to all these people that have been struggling for a while. Just let us give it a go. Open us up and let us try. That gig at the end of the week is medicine and it can change, it can change a bad week into an absolutely incredible weekend that um, can change your life. I it can change your life. Having the opportunity to make friends with strangers who share the same passion as you, essentially, just trying to trigger those happy memories again. And obviously you'd be supporting artists again and helping people keep their jobs, which, I mean, you can't, you can't say no to, to that, can you? Let's get back to that as soon as we can. Um, Whilst being respectful of each other, uh, let's get music industry, live music industry back on its feet as soon as we can. Hopefully this film brings awareness to people that might not fully understand the, um, what's the word? The repercussions of this on our industry and how hard it's gonna be for us to recover. Music by its very nature is about people getting together in a room and singing, performing. That's that's not allowed at the moment. It's also about performing in front of an audience. That's not allowed at the moment. So just think about it. Just take a second and sit back and just go, it's not just Justin Bieber who's being affected by this. It's every single person involved in music globally. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. Grimmy. <laughs> Need to put some cheery music along with it. Been trying to find my way out this hole. Looking for some open road I'll climb until I can no more Cause you know I'll fight the war Don't give them a lie, don't you know You know I'll fight the 